This lecture focuses on chapter 14, the somatic nervous system. This diagram shows the somatic nervous system in terms of the sensory division and the motor division of the peripheral nervous system. It's helpful to remember that somatic is concerned with things that we are consciously aware of. So the somatic sensory receptors are going to send information from the skin and the skeletal muscles into the somatosensory cortex of the brain. Notice that somato is used in that term. And so the somatosensory cortex of the brain is going to receive that information from the skin and the skeletal muscles and make a decision about it. Then it's going to send it down the motor division to the somatic nervous system, which controls the voluntary actions of the skeletal muscle. So the somatic is the stuff we are consciously aware of, and some textbooks will include the special sensory receptors in with the somatic, simply because uh, you are consciously aware of vision, smell, taste, and hearing. Let's start talking about the sensory division. The sensory division is composed of sensory nerve endings and their afferent nerves. And since we're talking about nerve endings and nerves, we're of course in the peripheral nervous system division. Sensations arise from the skin, skeletal muscles, and those will be your somatic ones, but they also can arise from visceral organs and glands. Sensory receptors are specialized to respond to change in their environment. They are classified by the type of stimulus they detect, by their body location, and by their structural complexity. Most sensory neurons are unipolar. The exceptions include bipolar neurons found in the retina of the eye. Some receptors are unencapsulated and some receptors are capsulated. A capsule is a protective uh, um, surrounding and uncapsulated receptors lack that protective surrounding. There are free nerve endings that are exposed ends of the sensory dendrites. There are root hair plexuses that wrap around a hair follicle. And then there are tactile discs, which are flattened nerve endings that attach to tactile cells called Merkel cells, which reside in the basal layer of the epidermis. The free nerve endings are going to reside close to the skin surface and in the mucous membranes. And they are mainly going to respond to pain and temperature, but also respond to light touch and pressure. They may be what's called phasic or tonic. Root hair plexuses are located in deeper layers of the dermis. They detect hair displacement, and they are generally phasic receptors. The tactile discs, which respond to light touch, are tonic receptors. From what I remember, phasic receptors can be phased out, meaning that if the sensation occurs for a long enough period of time, you become unaware of it. Whereas tonic receptors are going to be sensed every time a stimulus occurs. Now here is a table that shows the free nerve endings. You can see the tactile discs and hair follicles. The encapsulated tactile receptors are going to have a protective surrounding. And that surrounding is going to be made up of connective tissues as well as neurolemocytes. Remember, those are swan cells. 
The encapsulated tactile receptors include pacinian corpuscles that are located deep in the dermis, the hypodermis, and some organ walls. Ruffini corpuscles, which are located within the dermis and the subcutaneous layer. And the Meisner's corpuscles, which are located in dermal papillae, particularly in sensitive regions of the body. Pacinian corpuscles detect deep pressure, coarse touch, and high frequency vibration. And these are phasic receptors. Ruffini corpuscles are located within the dermis and the subcutaneous layer. They detect deep pressure and skin distortion, and they are tonic receptors. Meisner's corpuscles are going to be for discriminative light touch, and they allow recognition of texture and shape, and they are basic receptors. <clears throat> illustration shows the Meisner's corpuscles, Pacinian corpuscles, and Ruffini endings. This illustration shows examples of sensory neuron structures, and you get a good view of them side by side. You can see the free nerve endings here, so that's an uncapsulated receptor. This is an encapsulated nerve ending covered in the connective tissues and neurolemocytes, basically myelin. Here we see a sensory cell that has like hairs to it, which are sometimes called cilium, and you have stereocilia for sound and kinocilia for movement. And then this is a peripheral process that, if I am correct, is found in like your nose because it goes straight to the thalamus, not through ganglia. Excuse me, it doesn't go straight through the thalamus. It goes straight to the, um, the limbic system, the olfactory cortex. It bypasses the thalamus, whereas all these guys are gonna go through the thalamus. But I digress. All right, let's look at the classification of sensory receptors by stimulus type. There are mechanoreceptors, thermoreceptors, photoreceptors, and chemoreceptors. Mechanoreceptors, think mechanical. So these are gonna be your mechanical forces, such as touch, pressure, vibration, and stretch. Thermo, temperature. Photo, light energy. Chemo, chemicals. And so chemoreceptors will detect the molecules that are smelled or taste, as well as changes in the blood or the interstitial or tissue fluid. This illustration shows the types of the environmental stimuli detected by each of those receptor types mentioned prior. So with the mechanical, there's pressure, touch, motion, sound, vibration, gravity. Thermal, there's heat, cold, and even infrared radiation. Chemicals, individual types of molecules. And electromagnetic, if it's visible light, that's photo. And then there's also electricity and even magnetism. And a lot of animals are very sensitive to magnetism, so much so that it aids in the migration of certain animals because they can tell the poles to the poles. These guys, the nociceptors, are going to respond to potentially damaging stimuli that result in pain. And so pain comes from searing heat, extreme cold, excessive pressure, and inflammatory chemicals. Now let's look at the classification of sensory receptors by their location. There are exteroreceptors, enteroreceptors, and proprioreceptors. So you can tell already that exteroreceptors are going to respond to stimuli arising outside of the body. And enteroreceptors will respond to stimuli within the body. 
And proprioceptors will be the response to balance and the coordination stimuli. Exoreceptors respond to touch, pressure, pain, and temperature. And this are going to be from the skin, as well as most of the receptors found in the special senses like sight, smell, taste, and hearing. Enteroreceptors will monitor chemical changes in the body as well as tissue stretch and to temperature in the, inside the body because you have an internal temperature and you're also uh, monitoring that. Enteroreceptors may cause us to feel pain, discomfort, hunger, or thirst. And then the proprioceptors, since they're responding to balance and coordination, they will be found in the skeletal muscles, tendons, joints, and ligaments as well as connective tissue covering bones and muscles. And so this is why I mentioned that um, somatic sensations arise from the skin and skeletal muscles. So the skin will be responding to like, you know, the exteroreceptor stimuli, and then the skeletal muscles will be responding to the proprioceptor stimuli. So here's some information about, or illustrations about those different types of receptors. The exhale receptors, you can see the vision, the rods and cones, hearing, smell, taste, and then touch. There's the free nerve ending mentioned before, and then the Meisner's corpuscles. With the interoreception, it's just reminding you that it's going to be monitoring the organs, blood vessels, etc. And then the proprioceptors. Here we see uh, muscle spindle fibers, and Golgi tendon organs. And we see that muscle spindles detect muscle length and the velocity of the muscle length changes. And then Golgi tendon organs will detect muscle tension and force. Gotta go get Bailey, hold on. Okay, Bailey's back. That's my dog. Now let's look at the receptor distribution. So we've seen three things. We've seen the um, types of stimuli that they respond to, where they're located, and then as far as their exterior and interior, and then now their, their general distribution. So uh, with that, the general sense receptors are distributed throughout the body, and then the special sense receptors are found in the head. And the general sense receptors, um, the most abundant of those are called tactile receptors. And they are found within the skin and are responsible for the touch. And so all those like free nerve endings, uh, hair follicles, Meissner's corpuscles, Pacinian corpuscles, all of those bad boys are in that tactile receptor general sense distribution. The special sense receptors found in the complex sense organs of the head are going to be involved with the five special senses. So olfaction, which is smell, gustation is taste, vision, sight, audition is hearing, and there's even equilibrium centers in the ear along with that audition. So proprioception and balance and coordination are going to be found in numerous parts of the body and equilibrium is one of those and will be found in the ear. Okay, so here's the olfaction, gustation, all that in more detail. So special sensory receptors are located to specific organs within the head and the olfaction is smell, and so that's going to be what's called olfactory epithelium in the nose. Gustation is taste, and those are going to be the taste buds of the tongue. The vision is in the eyes, particularly the retina. Those are your rods and cones. Hearing, uh, this will be the cochlea of the inner ear, and balance will be in the vestibule of the inner ear. And you can see that um, olfaction and gustation are both chemical senses. Vision is electromagnetic, so it's photo. And then hearing and balance are both mechanical because hearing is a result of vibrations, sound waves that are going through the air. So it's hitting, you know, your um, ear 
drum and vibrating. And then the balance is also mechanical because that's, you know, your location of the movement, uh, whether you're moving forward, backward, side to side, or spinning. The slide describes how the sensory information is recognized and carried to the central nervous system. So first and foremost, there has to be a local depolarization of the receptor. So this goes back to, you know, all of the light end plate potentials, graded potentials, all of those things that lead us to a threshold. So the stimulus will then hopefully take us to that threshold. And if so, then an action potential will be generated. And this will propagate towards the central nervous system. And once it reaches the central, central nervous system, it will be integrated, AKA processed. And so sensory information, except for olfaction, smell, is distributed through the thalamus first, then it goes to the appropriate centers of the brain. This illustration is showing some of those somatic sensory fibers because you see how it's in the skin and the skeletal muscle as well as in the joints. You know, part of that somatic, you're aware of your balance and uh, location in space and time. And then those uh, information from those somatic sensory receptors are going to then go t up the spinal cord. And uh, these are neither, you know, of these are smell, so you can see they all are going to synapse with the, th the thalamus. And then that's going to send them to the appropriate center in the brain for processing, which is going to be that somatosensory cortex. Now let's look at the motor division, um, that's somatic in particular. We'll look at autonomic next in the next chapter. The somatic motor neurons are going to control your skeletal muscles and they are voluntary. Remember, this is like consciously perceived. Whereas autonomic motor neurons are gonna control the smooth muscle, cardiac muscle glands, and the adipose tissue. And they are thus involuntary and subconscious. You're not really aware of them, they're reflexive. Sometimes you're aware, obviously, but you know, as a general rule, they're autonomic. It's like, I think of like autopilot, or um, if you drive an automatic transmission, put it in drive and the gears shift without you being aware of it. And that's what the autonomic motor neurons are doing. Okay, so let's look at features of the somatic nervous system. Uh, again, the voluntary control of the skeletal muscles. Most of the neurons are gonna be thick, heavily myelinated and conduct nerve impulses very rapidly. They arise from the ventral horns of the spinal cord and they directly connect with the muscle fibers that they innervate. They also create acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction. And in this case, the acetylcholine is gonna be excitatory. So it's gonna stimulate the opening of the channels at the motor end plate and sodium will come in and we're gonna to get to the end plate potential, which is that threshold. And if we reach that, then the action potential will occur and muscle fiber contraction will occur. So here are the command centers in the brain. Um, you've got the pre-command levels of the cerebellum and the basal nuclei. So just to remind you, uh, the cerebellum, you know, does uh, coordination, balance, and it actually can like predict the pattern of the movements that are going to come next. And so it's predictive. It's a, it's a problem solver. And then the basal nuclei are going to um, augment the skeletal muscles so that they are in a coordinated, smooth fashion. That's why with Parkinson's disease, when the basal nuclei are damaged from a lack of dopamine, they become overactive and it causes the tremors and such to occur because they're no longer augmenting or facilitating skeletal muscle movement. And then by the time it's ready to actually go out of the brain and into the skeletal muscles, that is going to be sent from the primary motor cortex. One other area of the brain that functions in the motor control is the premotor cortex here, which is gonna have a lot of your muscle memory. And I actually um, experienced that yesterday, just for example purposes, I was asked to 
provide an identification number to verify my identity. And I had a hard time just saying the numbers. But if I were have asked to type it, I type it so much that I can type it no problem. I know I know it right off the bat. But just to then say it, I had to go through the motions like in my head and imagine the keyboard. And I think you all are going to relate to that because I see students all the time when doing their student ID. I'm like, what's your student ID? And I'll actually see their fingers moving as they are imagining the keyboard and typing that in. <laughs> and so that's why the premotor cortex is so important. That's the reason for that example I just gave you because that's your muscle memory. Like we attach a lot of our memory to our, our movements and uh, that association is the real deal. Okay, so then once it's leaving the um, primary motor cortex, and remember there's a homunculus here that's going to take it to, you know, um, particular places in the body. So it looks like this one is going down to skeletal muscle, um, wherever in the body, and uh, is going to cross over in the medulla oblongata. If you recall, that's called the decussation of the pyramids. And so we do have some crossing over. And some of them don't cross over, you know, but um, that one is found here. It's a, it's a type of tract called the anterior corticospinal tract. It doesn't cross over in the medulla, but notice it crosses over in the spinal cord. So crossing over is going to occur at some point. And then it's going to go to the other side of the body and control that particular skeletal muscle. And then all of the things that are in this illustration are helping it out. I wish that this artist had colored the premotor cortex, um, but alas, I can tell you about it. Sometimes information needs to be processed at a faster rate than what voluntary motor pathways can produce. Because if you think about it with the voluntary motor pathways, since the brain is involved, um, there are synapses that are going to be involved as well. Because you have to travel up and then go through the synapses from cerebellum to basal ganglia to premotor cortex to primary motor cortex, all of this stuff. And so there's a thing that's called synaptic delay. Because every time an action potential reaches the end of the neuron at the synapse, it has to then release a neurotransmitter. And then that neurotransmitter has to activate the postsynaptic neuron, and then it has to travel to the next one. So that's called synaptic delay. So it can actually delay the process of movement. Reflexes help avoid that because they are a rapid involuntary motor response to stimulus. And they can go like straight through the spinal cord and it um, reduces the synaptic delay and aids in you withdrawing from you know, a painful or harmful situation in a very rapid way. And there are two big types of ref reflexes, the inborn or intrinsic reflexes, and then what's called learned or acquired reflexes. The inborn reflexes is a rapid, involuntary, predictable motor response to stimulus, and you're born with it. Like you don't like pupillary dilation. That's a, you know, an intrinsic reflex. Uh, and then learned reflexes result from practice or reputation or repetition like driving. And this is the reflex arc. There are five elements. There's the receptor. And so this is somatic because it's in the skin here. And it's going to bring that information up to the spinal cord. This is where the ganglia would be. Um, and this is your sensory neuron. This is the integration center since it's in the spinal cord. And then notice it's going to loop right out and go back to that muscle. We're not going up to the brain. We're not doing all that synaptic delay. We're going straight to our muscles so that in this case, you know, we've accidentally been stuck with a pin. So most likely we're going to do a withdrawal reflex and get away from that pin or pull it out of our skin real quick. And so the motor neuron is illustrated here and then the muscle is your effector. Testing of reflexes is clinically important to assess the condition of the nervous system. Exaggerated, distorted, or absent reflexes indicate degeneration or pathology of specific nervous system regions. 
Some of the important clinical reflexes are stretch reflexes and the withdrawal crossed extensor reflex. So stretch reflexes um, are going to be for skeletal muscle activity to be smoothly coordinated. Proprioceptor input is necessary and this helps to maintain muscle tone and body posture. For the withdrawal and crossed extensor reflexes, they are initiated by painful stimuli and cause automatic withdrawal of the threatened body part from the stimulus. The patellar knee jerk reflex is an example of the stretch reflex. And number one says tapping of the patellar ligament. That's occurring. Um, there's the tap, tap. And it's going to excite the muscle spindle fibers in the quadriceps. And remember, muscle spindle fibers are going to monitor like stretch and velocity of the muscle contractions and stretch and all that. And number two, uh, the afferent impulses, which are the sensory that approach uh, the spinal cord. And this is where the synapses occur with the motor neurons and the inner neurons. And we're going to loop because it's a reflex. We're not going up to the brain. We're going to loop on. And in 3A, it says the motor neurons in red are going to send acting, activating impulses to the quadriceps, causing it to contract and extend the knee. And then 3B, it says these inner neurons are going to make inhibitory synapses with the ventral horn neurons that prevent the antagonistic muscles, which are your hamstrings, from resisting the contraction of the quadriceps, so they're not going to be an antagonist in this case. They're going to let the quadriceps uh, do what they do, and when the quadriceps contracts, that's what extends the knee, because that's what quadriceps do. So, in a nutshell, when you are hitting the patellar ligament, it is causing a stretch of that ligament. It's causing a stretch of the quadriceps muscles. As a result, the reflex is for you to extend your knee to prevent falling or to prevent harming the ligaments or the tendons or the quadriceps. And that's why you're going to reflexively kick your knee out. And the hamstrings will then be quieted because they're not going to try to counteract that reflexive motion. And lastly, it's not going up to the brain in this case because it is bypassing that since it is a reflex. This is the withdrawal and crossed extensor reflex. Um, over here with the uh, withdrawal, um, the site of the stimulus, you know, like someone grabbing an arm, you're going to reflexively withdraw. So you're going to excite the um, protagonist in this case, which is the biceps that will flex and move your hand away from the stimulus and then it's going to inhibit the antagonist which is the triceps and the reason that this is an example of the crossed extensor is because notice that it's also connected to the other side of the body because you could lose your balance if you are flexing because that's going to send you to the side uh, opposite your flexing so just right now you know flex your arm and notice that it kind of sends you over to the opposite side of where you have flexed if you're not you know totally in control of that movement thus to counteract that the opposite side of your body is then going to reflexively extend that arm in particular to help you contain your balance and if you have ever done any type of martial arts you'll notice that in a lot of um, your katas or your you know routines that you do um, there will be a lot of with crossed extensor reflex motions that are going on to help you to train those reflexes so that you are more efficient if it comes to the need for you to use your skills. Here's another example of the withdrawal and crossed extensor reflex. In this case, the person has stepped on a rock and it hurts really bad. And so what they need to do is they need to lift their leg. And so what we see here is number one, the painful stimulus detected is going to, you know, cause the withdrawal reflex. Uh, number two, 
uh, the sensory nerve signal is going to be detected by the interneurons. And then in 3A, this neuron is connected to the hamstrings. And so that stimulates the motor neurons to the reflexors, withdraw, with, uh, resulting in the withdrawal of the limb from the painful stimulus. And then it looks here that 3B is located on the quadriceps of the opposite leg. And it says other inner neurons cross to the opposite side and stimulate motor neurons to the extensors resulting in extensor contraction and support of body weight. So voila, there you go. There are superficial reflexes that are also clinically important and they are elicited by gentle cutaneous stimulation. These are fun. These are the plantar reflex and the abdominal reflex. The plantar reflex tests the integrity of the spinal cord from L4 to S2 and it is elicited by drawing a blunt object distally along the lateral aspect of the plantar surface of the foot. The normal response in adults is the curling of the toes downward. And the normal response for infants is called the Babinski reflex and it causes the toes to fan out. The abdominal reflex tests the integrity of the spinal cord and the ventral rami from T8 to T12 and the normal response is contraction to the abdomen. So this might, um, you know, uh, explain being ticklish and how you move when you're ticklish. So if somebody comes to tickle you in your abdominal area, you will reflexively contract towards that area that they are tickling you at. You'll be like, stop it, okay? And then with the plantar reflex, again, if somebody goes and tickles the bottom of your... Um, toes or you're the bottom of your foot you're probably going to curl your toes if you're you know not an infant if you're an infant you'll spread your toes but i don't think anybody watching this is an infant so we're all going to be curling our toes and again telling the person to stop and i think that the reason we laugh laughter in um you know social studies is um it diffuses tension and so I wonder if like we're laughing, like it's a way to try to get that person to stop because it's like, you know, it's okay. You're not like hurting, but it's also just trying to like diffuse that tension. I don't know. But anyway, if you ever, people are always wondering what ticklishness is and why. And there's a couple of theories for you. So here's your Babinski reflex for the baby. And then there's your plantar reflex for the adults. And this is showing the blunt object being moved on the lateral uh, side of the foot, distally meaning towards the toes. And then here's the abdominal reflexes. So again, you can see that um, the normal response is the contraction of the underlying muscle and the umbilicus will move laterally up or down depending on the quadrant tested. And so basically you just go and tickle anybody and if they contract and move towards that tickling and they are good. The last um, information about the peripheral nervous system is going to center around like referred pain. So visceral pain results from the noxious stimulation of receptors in the organs of the thorax and the abdominal cavity. Visceral pain is usually a sensation of a dull aching, gnawing, or burning. Uh, extreme stretching, ischemia, irritating chemicals, and muscle spasms are important in visceral pain. Pain. And ischemia is like a lack of blood flow. Uh, visceral pain afferents travel along the same pathways as somatic pain fibers. So for instance, your skin, okay? And this is called referred pain. So stimuli arising in one part of the body are perceived as coming from another part. For example, a person experiencing a heart attack, <laughs> attack, not attach, a person experiencing a heart attack may feel pain that radiates along the left arm because the spinal segments T1 through T5 innervate both the heart and the left arm. So this is an illustration showing the referred pain and here's the heart and the left arm. Oh, and that's it. All right, thank you all for listening.